Heart of a Dog is a satirical novel through which its author, Mikhail Bulgakov, commentates on communism and the Bolshevik Revolution. Upon its completion, the book was disclosed to only a group of intellectuals in 1925, and it immediately brought trouble to Bulgakov. The novel was banned and wasn't published up until 1987, many years after Bulgakov's death, but copies of it were printed secretly and circulated discreetly in the Soviet Union. The book designated Bulgakov as a danger to Russia. He had many of his belongings confiscated his books, his notebooks and his diary. Now let us look at the plot of Heart of a Dog and let us analyse its meaning. The novel opens up with a monologue by a dog named Cherique and then a third-person omniscient narrator takes over to provide a less subjective description of the events that unravel. Sharik is a grumpy dog, is ill at ease. He speaks of how he was assaulted by a cook who threw boiling water at him. Sharik howls with pain and a wind howls along with him. He thinks the cook didn't have to attack him. Sharik wasn't trying to steal any comestible meat, he was just searching for scraps in the rubbish. It's only 4pm and it's already dark, it's winter. Sharik contrasts how his body is all beaten up, has been injured many a time, he doesn't foresee much of a bright prospect, he thinks the injury in his left side will probably cause him further problems and that is likely to contract pneumonia, it'll be the end of him. But his spirits are up. A typist passes him by, he bemoans her condition, she's a typist and because of the Bolshevik revolution a wage has been cut down. He notices her ill-washed shabby underclothes, she's impoverished and probably oppressed by a violent boyfriend. She looks stressed and cold. What a poor last that typist must be. We will meet her again after Sharik's transformation. Another person passes by, and this is a different kind of person. He doesn't look like a papa. He's more sophisticated than your run-of-the-mill working person. Sharik refers to the man as a citizen and not a comrade. One of the tenets of communism is that society should be classless and that all people should be alike. But it looks like this is not working, because Sharik immediately recognises Professor Philip Filipovich Preobrazinsky as a member of an upper class. He's nothing like the typists, the cooks or all the proletarians that Sharik is accustomed to dealing with. And he's right. Preobrazinsky is a reputed surgeon who knows nothing of the struggles that plague the lives of the proletarians. Sharik insists that it is not the clothes that Professor Preobrazinsky is wearing that indicate his difference, it's his eyes. The man gets closer and Sharik does everything to get his attention. The man bends down and offers Sharik a piece of good meat, unlike the one they serve at the canteens. Sharik is in awe at the extraordinary gesture of kindness. Preobrazinsky frisks Sharik and seems delighted that Sharik doesn't have a collar. He gestures to Sharik to follow him and the dog doesn't need to think twice. He elatedly follows Filip Filipovich and on their way, they pass by a cat that gets all excited by the smell of the meats that the professor is carrying. Sharik valiantly scares the cat away in an attempt to further endear himself to his distinguished master. Upon their arrival to the professor's building, they meet the janitor Theodore. Sharik instinctively fears the janitor. Janitors usually chase him away pretty violently, but not this time. Professor Probrazensky effortlessly subdues the janitor. There's a clear relationship of class difference that forces the janitor to retreat and to allow the professor and his doctor into the building. Theodore talks to the professor deferentially, and he tells him that there are some new tenants. They'll be living in flat 3, dividing the flat with its previous residents. The Housing Management Committee has decreed so. In fact, every flat in the building is expected to welcome new tenants except the professors. The professor is dejected at how this is likely to affect the building. More residents is definitely more trouble. Add to this all the construction work it'll take to ready the flats to accommodate more people. It's interesting that when the professor and his dog get to the flats, the professor tells Sharik, Welcome Mr. Sharik. It foreshadows Sharik's transformation into a person. Professor Preobrazensky's home is clean and posh. There's a woman called Zina who appears to work for him. He asks her to take Sharik to the consulting room. A consulting room? The mansion of the consulting room sends a cold down Sharik's spine. His amazement starts to turn into fear and then panic. He recognises surgical equipment and the smell of drugs. He panics some more and tries to escape. The professor and Zena try to immobilise him but he's too quick and he manages to evade them. Then another man, Dr. Bormenthal, makes an appearance. 
He joins in the effort of mobilizing Sharik. He gets bitten, but eventually catches a dog and sedates him. Dr. Bormental is the professor's assistant. He's a young, good-looking, well-built man. Sharik passes out, and when he wakes up, he finds out that his side injury is being tended to, and he gets to observe what the professor is specialized in. The professor welcomes a patient. It appears the professor is a plastic surgeon specialized in rejuvenation. Patients come to him to look younger. He charges a lot of money, but is good at his craft. In a communist society where people have had their wages reduced and are fed practically inedible meat, other people can afford to put good money to look younger. That's where the other disparities that capitalism produces and that the Bolshevik revolution is supposed to fight. From the very first chapters, it is clear that the novel would poke fun and point at holes in the ideals that the Russian Revolution brands. Later, a group of four people come to see the professor. The members of the House Committee and Schwanda, the most enthusiastic of the bunch, is the leader. The professor talks to them pretty disdainfully. They're very obsequious in the beginning due to the apparent difference between them and the professor. But they assume a more confrontational tone when they all tell him that they've come to notify him that he has to share his apartment with people. He has way too much space and way too many valuable things. The professor defiantly tells them that yes, he lives alone, he is unmarried, yes, there are seven rooms in his apartment, he needs them all, and that in fact he wishes he had eight rooms, not seven. They are shocked by his non-compliance. Schwander threatens to report him. The professor takes his phone and calls Schwander's superior to complain to him about the disturbance that Schwander's causing. The professor hands Schwander the phone and the man gets severely reprimanded. Disgruntled but helpless, the group of four leaves. The scene exposes the cracks in a society that protects one of its enemies. Professor Preobrazensky is an enemy of what the Bolshevik Revolution calls for. He doesn't comply with the new rules and he hates the ideology behind those rules. Yet, because of his power, he gets protected by the higher-ups, who are supposed to effectuate the redistribution of wealth and the erasure of social classes. Up to this point, Professor Preobrazensky's aversion to the revolution and its ideals is inferred through his actions. He is hoity, he resists reallocations, then he converses with Dr. Bowmental over dinner and this time he unequivocally speaks about how the revolution has worsened everything. The professor compares life before the revolution and after it. Before the Bolshevik revolution, electricity rarely went off, something like twice in 20 years, but now going dark is common, outages happen monthly. Sharik is everything. He shares the same disdain the professor has for the proletariat. It shows how a dog who doesn't know much about ideologies and ideals naturally arrives at the same conclusions that a sophisticated man draws. The failure of the new system is apparent to the trained eye of an intellectual just as it is apparent to the untrained eye of a non-human observer. Sharik is further impressed by Professor Preobrazensky's character. Sharik's former fear when he discovered the surgical equipment dissipates. He is proud and thankful for having been picked by the professor. A week goes by. A week Sharik would easily qualify as the best week in his life. He is fed top quality food. He is well protected from the cold and from the cruelty of angry cooks and frustrated workers. The professor takes him out, and on these occasions, Sharik thinks of himself as an extension of the professor. He looks stern on the famished animals in the streets. One day, Sharik wakes up not feeling as good as usual. He has the presentiment that something bad is likely to happen. The professor gets a phone call, which Sharik hears is the professor's excitement at what his interlocutor tells him, and the words, excellent, bring it at once. Not much time passes before Dr. Bormental shows up, all excited too, and holding a suitcase. His arrival spurs the professor to abandon his half-full cup of coffee and to jump to meet him. He's as excited as a little kid in front of a gift. He contemplates the suitcase and asks Bormental, when did he die? Bormental answers three hours ago, who's this he Sharik doesn't know and is troubled. Bormental's arrival creates a real tumult. Everybody's running and getting ready for something. And in the midst of all this commotion, the professor orders his cohorts to keep Sharik away from any food and to lock him up and he immediately gets confined in the bathroom for about a quarter of an hour. Inside the bathroom, Sharik's anguish turns into panic. 
There's clearly something bad coming down. He howls and jumps everywhere inside the bathroom, but there's not much he can do. He remains there until the door is opened, and as soon as he gets out, Gina snatches him from his newly granted collar and takes him to the examination room. There, he finds Professor Filip Filipovich Preobrazinski and his assistant, Dr. Bormenthal. Zina immobilizes Sharik on a bed, and this event of the surgery takes significant place in the novel and is described in minute details. It is the most important event in the narrative. It is the climax that radically changes the main character's life. The professor manages to transplant a dead man's pituitary gland and testicles in Sharik's body. The operation is a success. The professor's intent in performing the transplant is exploratory. He doesn't know what it'll yield. The professor, Dr. Bormenthal, Zina and Petrovna all witness how the transplant would lead to the transformation of Sharik into a man. It would seem that the transformation of an animal into a human being is an upgrade. But the new Sharik is an abject man. He is a drunkard who lives in filth, assaults women, enjoys torturing cats, and tries to inform in the professor's counter-revolutionary positions. Sharik, or Sharikov as he would demand to be called, embraces the slogans of communism, although he doesn't understand many of the ideas behind those slogans, but he brands them as the professor's face. The name of the professor, Preobrazinski, literally means of the transfiguration. So this is what the professor does. He transfigures an animal that represents a natural order to create an abject creature. While in theory, a man is superior to an animal. The type of man that Sharik becomes is abject and repulsive. What the Bolshevik Revolution did was transfigure a natural society built around competition around resources and positions, where there's hierarchy that rewards the hardworking and the skilled. This sort of competition is natural, because it is observed in all types of organisms, animals, microbes. The replacement that the revolution enforced is superior to that natural order only in theory and slogans. No hierarchy, equality, sameness, classlessness, but in reality none of this is real. The new society is impoverished, corrupt and sad. The surgical operation that the professor performs in the dog is described in a lot of details. At one point, Dr. Bormenthal shaves the hair around Sharik's belly and tries to shave very closely that there's blood that comes out, just like how the Bolshevik revolution spilled a lot of blood. Sharik's transformation into a man is gradual. It takes some time to complete. The new Sharik is usually drunk, is disrespectful of the professor and everybody at his home. Sharik continues to run havoc in the professor's apartment. He chases a cat and breaks a tap which leaves water running. Bulgakov shows how the empowerment of the uneducated, unrefined proletariats results in the destruction of everything of value in the country. Sharik is a constant eyesore. He befriends Schwander from the housing committee who feeds him the ideals of the Bolshevik revolution, both orally and by lending him the Engels correspondences with Kautsky. Sharik tells the professor that he has met the house committee and that he needs documents to register as an inhabitant in the building. The professor starts to criticize the meaninglessness of bureaucracy and the demand for documents, but Sharik runs to the defense of the system by telling the professor that the committee works for the benefits of the working class and that documents protect their rights. It is funny how Sharik considers himself a member of the working class, although he doesn't work. It shows how the term working class is so loose that it is branded by everybody and anybody, even those who don't work. The professor points to the obvious facts that Sharik doesn't have any surname or birth certificate, which are necessary for any registration. Sharik replies that he has in fact chosen a name for himself, Polygraph, Polygrapovich, Sharikov. The polygraph is the machine that is used to get access to the truth. It is used in interrogations. It refers to how communism and the Bolshevik revolution brand the ideals of honesty, integrity and truth, while in reality they're all based in deceit. The professor grants Sharik what he wants and he becomes Polygraph, Polygrapovich, Sharikov. Schwander comes in to ratify the documents and the professor signs them all. After that, Schwander helps Sharikov get a job and look at the job he gets. Sharikov becomes the head of the sub-department for the control of stray animals in the precincts of the city of Moscow. The new Bolshevik state gives jobs to people even when they're not qualified. 
The job itself that Cherikov gets is interesting. A big part of Cherikov's job is killing cats, strangling them, that is. We see throughout the novel how Cherikov hates cats due to his canine nature. He's always trying to kill them either in the streets or in the professor's apartment. And here, the state gives him a job that allows him to practice his sadistic inclinations. This parallels how government employees mistreat people and how they use their jobs to satisfy their sadistic impulses just like like Sherikov. When Sherikov is asked what happens to the dead bodies of the cats, he describes how their fur is turned into counterfeit squirrel fur. Again, under the big slogans of egalitarianism, the state gives the poppers the illusion that they too can get squirrel fur by selling them dead cats. Sherikov clashes with Dr. Bormental and Professor Preobrezensky on multiple occasions. In a particular incident, Sherikov tells them that he refuses to call them by any honorific titles and that they are all comrades. This throws the professor out of himself. He insists that it is his home and that in it are misters and masters and that if Sherikov doesn't comply with that, he'll be asked to leave. Then Sherikov surprises everybody by saying that nobody can dislodge him from the apartment. He produces some papers from his pocket and he defiantly says that those documents entitle him to 13 square yards in apartment 5. This parallels how the Bolshevik Revolution obliges people to relinquish their properties and to share them with undeserving people. Not a day passes without a fight between Sherikov and the two doctors. He tells the professor that he owns too much space and property and that he has to share what he has with more people. It appears Sharikov has been reading the Engels Kautsky correspondences, the book that Schwander has given him earlier. The professor stands up furiously and has the book burned. Sharikov brings ill-mannered drunkards home. One night, he tries to force himself on Zina and Petrovna while they're sleeping. This sends them screaming in the middle of the night. Professor Preobrazensky and Dr. Bormental run to the rescue. They're shocked. The two women are half-naked and Sharikov is half-drunk. Dr. Bormental jumps at Cherikov and strangles him before the professor intervenes and separates the two. He manages to calm down Bormental. The following morning, Cherikov disappears. He's nowhere to be found. Some time passes before he reappears. Cherikov brings home a woman that he introduces as his typist who's soon to become his wife. It is the same person who passes him by at the beginning of the novel. She's a member of the proletariat and she's all happy that she's going to marry Sherikov. She is not repulsed by what he is. Professor Preobrazensky takes her aside and tells her that Sherikov is a dog. He confronts him with the truth, which Sherikov doesn't deny. The typist weeps and walks away. This leaves Sherikov infuriated. Later that day, the professor is visited by a former patient who's become a friend and who is also a high-ranking military officer. He tells the professor that somebody is spreading rumours about him. He shows him a report which describes Filip Filipovich Preobrazensky as engaging in counter-revolutionary activity. The officer reassures the professor that the author of the report is a nobody and that his word is worthless in comparison with Professor Filip Filipovich Preobrazensky's word, but that nonetheless the professor should look into those rumours. That day, upon his return to the flat, Polygraph Polygrapovich experiences an unpleasant premonition that forebodes something bad. His state of mind is similar to how he has felt the day he was operated on, and it is another operation that awaits him. He is tricked into the examination room and both the professor and Dr. Bormental sedate him and surgically remove his transplanted pituitary gland and testicles and implant in him his original organs. The operation is again a success. Sharik is back. There is no more Sharikov. People notice his disappearance. A group of police officers and representative of the housing committee visit the professor to inquire about the disappearance and possible murder of Polygraph Polygrapovich Sharikov. But the professor tells them that Sharikov has always been a dog and he shows them Sharik who is now a dog that talks and he still resembles Sharikov. There isn't any possible murder case anymore and they all leave. 
The novel starts with Sharik's monologue and ends with Sharik's monologue. Sharik is happy now. He is grateful to be the pet of such a distinguished man as Professor Filip Filipovich Preobrazensky. The novel shows how the Soviet society is transfigured by communism. It is degraded and impoverished. It will be better off if it reverted to pre-revolution. But the novel doesn't eulogize capitalism. It doesn't say that capitalism is the best system. It is the natural state. There could be some positive change. Sharikov turned out to be such a degenerate human being, maybe because the pituitary gland and the testicles they received are days of a good-for-nothing drunkard. The professor wonders that maybe if there were the organs of a distinguished mind like Spinoza, Sharikov could have turned out to be a much better and refined human being. It is interesting that Bolgakov praises Spinoza. It pushes us to look into Spinoza's political theory to understand what exactly in it appeals to Bulgakov. Spinoza considers that everything that exists is in God, so God for Spinoza is immanent as opposed to a transcendent God that is above and distinct from his creation. This principle demolishes the right by which Tsars or kings rule because they are supposed to rule in the name of a transcendent God. This shows that although Bulgakov insists that the Russian Empire from before the revolution is better than the post-Russian Revolution Soviet Union, who doesn't think that the Russian Empire under the Tsar is the best system. Also, for Spinoza, everything that exists is in nature and cannot exist outside nature. Hence, the communist ideals of classlessness and sameness are unattainable because they're not natural. So yes, the pre-revolution society was imperfect by any means, but it was definitely better than the post-revolution society. Communism doesn't work, but maybe other philosophies will. Now, this video has reached its end. Until we meet again, have a great day.